Hello, everyone. This is Bridget Danner with Women's Wellness Collaborative, excuse me, and, I, and I'm here with our head uh, coach and clinician, Anne Moline. Hi, Anne. Hey, Bridget. How's it going? Good. Good to have you here. Thanks. So we are going to get a little technical today. It should be a lot of fun. So if you're listening on the podcast, we are going to be going over some test results visually. Uh, I think you'll still be able to kind of glean the information even if you can't see it. But if you want to, you know, hop over to the link through the podcast and actually see the results that we're talking about, you can do that as well. So I thought to use it as an example um, of some of the tests we cover, I could use my own test results. That way we, you know, these are test results we've really looked at and advised me on some of them. Other people have advised me on others of them and these are all available through our company. So the ones I'm not gonna cover are ones that we've covered before. So we've covered already uh, the Dutch hormone test, the GI map stool test, is that mostly what we've covered so far? Yeah, I don't know if we've covered a SIBO test before, maybe. Um, thyroid. I think maybe. you maybe did that for the YouTube yeah. channel. There's some on the YouTube. So we'll link to some of the tests that we haven't covered. Just because we don't talk about it today doesn't mean it's not listed. But we want to highlight some things we've never talked about. And those are mostly around toxicity. So we're adding that element into our functional coaching program. And it's pretty exciting because as you'll see from some of my test results and how they correlate to my symptoms, having a toxic load in your body very much leads to low energy, you know, poor sleep, mood imbalances, chronic pain, can lead to hair loss, to pretty much anything, you name it, unexplained weight gain um, can happen through toxicity. And I think most of us know that we're toxic, but we don't really know like what to do with that. So, Anne, do you find that your clients or clients that you're seeing are, are kind of curious or wondering, like, how do I know if I'm really toxic? Yeah, well, I think it's a question that a lot of people have. And I think it's also somehow surprising to them. Like you were saying, we all kind of know, but then people also often seem surprised by just how toxic their environment might be when you start digging into it a little bit and kind of evaluating even people who think they have really clean lifestyle and eating really clean foods and all of that but then not recognizing that everything you put on your skin everything that you put your food onto or into and um, everything you know from your carpet to your shower curtain and all of that could also be contributing. So a hundred percent. Yeah. We all have blind spots on um, areas of our life. And then you'll see from some of my tests, like there's ones I'm like, I have no idea how I, how I'm so high in this toxin. It's probably just, it's also going to be location of your home. Mm -hmm. We are exposed to at work, certainly. So there's a lot of sources and to some extent you do need to sleuth the sources, but I think to another extent you need to get it out of your body because some of these exposures were old and they're just hanging around. The mm. body isn't strong enough to, to get it out. So it's just hanging out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Making you tired. I am thinking of, there's actually a couple of clients that we've had who are coming to mind for me right now who had, pretty significant childhood exposures that seem to be um, driving some of the current challenges that they're having with their health. So, mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let me start some screen sharing here. Yeah. Let me pull up the test I'm going to start with. So I just had a new hair, hair, hair mineral analysis test run, but the results haven't come in yet. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I'm going to show an older one that I had. And let's go full screen with that. Okay, is that looking nice and visible? Um, yeah, totally. basically. Yeah. Okay, I can, let me see if I can zoom in. I know this has happened before that people are like, why can't you zoom in? <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Oh, it did work. Got some okay. tab madness going on. Bridget. I thought I was bad. <laughs> oh, God, no, that's all the time. 
<laughs> but I did get this enlarged, so that's really great. Yeah. So first let, test we're going to look at if you're just listening is a hair mineral analysis. So this is testing kind of toxic minerals as well as beneficial minerals, I guess you could say, because those minerals are competing for the same receptor sites. So for example, if, if you are watching and you can see, it looks like I have very high magnesium. That's the MG, that's the second one from the left. So I thought, oh my gosh, I guess I'm taking too much magnesium. There's so much magnesium in my hair, but that's not the case. It's basically other imbalances with my toxicity that are pushing magnesium out into my hair. It's like a waste product instead of circulating, staying circulating in my body. So this is pretty eye-opening for me because I'm a person who could take like a lot of magnesium every day. My body just soaks it up. And if I don't have enough, I have leg cramps. So just this is, um, we're just going to point out today some different little clues that you can see on these kind of tests. So the magnesium showed up, um, mercury showed up. You know, the arsenic looks very low, but when I had this interpreted, She's like, anything that shows up is kind of bad, basically. So this arsenic I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, but those are a few highlights you can see here. And then they talk about some of the ratios, like how is calcium comparing to phosphorus? And how is, let's see, potassium comparing to um, sodium? And it just kind of looks like gibberish. <laughs> if you're not really, uh, you know, you've never looked at it before, this is why we do it with interpretation. So I'll just share some of when my had this interpreted, my arsenic was high, my aluminum was high, my tin was high, and my thallium was high. And then looking at the ratios, it suggested that I had very slow metabolism, which for me doesn't really result in excess weight, but it, it results in being really tired. Um, it also said that, let's see, I didn't have much in the good range, but I had some. It said I had moderate to high hypothyroid symptoms, which, you know, is, was accurate as well. Um, I had some imbalance in zinc to copper, which can result in some hormone imbalance. And do you want to talk about that at all? Um, Excess zinc copper. To, zinc to copper. Um, and that can actually lead to a lot of um, mood dysregulation. So it's a really interesting thing that um, almost every single person with an eating disorder is low in zinc and will have a dysregulated zinc to copper ratio. Um, and so it's kind of a critical one, but it also just impacts a lot of areas of um, like depression, irritability, anxiety, and that kind of thing. I, so I think about it on that realm a lot. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. Low zinc is super common. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I've learned about heavy metals is actually putting in the beneficial metals can kind of push out the toxic metals. So, you know, that's kind of encouraging because it sounds fairly simple, so to speak, not to say it's like 100% that simple. Um, but, you know, there, there are solutions. So I got a lot of these tests to share. So I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, I'll just look at this next one briefly. This is a glyphosate test. So glyphosate is an ingredient in Roundup. And, you know, I eat a lot of organic food. I don't eat out a lot. And my results were fairly high on glyphosate still. I would say, I don't know, what do you think that is? Like 60th percentile, Anne? Mm -hmm. Yeah, roughly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So the glyphosate is a problem for leaky gut. And it could be other things as well. It's mentioning autism, depression, diabetes, autoimmune disease. Um, also, I've really heard that the adjuvants in Roundup are, are maybe even more of the problem, like glyphosate, uh, pesticide is a problem, but that also all the junk <laughs> that's with it is also a problem. So that's not being tested right here, but um, it's pretty interesting. And I think when we start to put all these tests together, we can start to see patterns. So why is my glyphosate so high? I don't know. It could be because, as we're going to see in a minute, that many of my toxins 
uh, are pretty high. So it could just be that my body can't process it out. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be kind of hiding in the tissues. Now, I just had this done and I sauna twice a week. I do coffee enemas once or twice a week. I use binders. Like I'm, I'm no joke taking care of my health and this is still happening. So, you know, definitely all of us are vulnerable. Okay, moving on. This is a mycotoxin test that we do offer. This is a urine test. Sorry, the first one was hair. Second was urine. This is urine again. So this is a test of mycotoxins from toxic mold. So if you follow me for a while, you probably know I was to toxic mold. <laughs> uh, it's very much affected my health probably for 10 years, but definitely since I've had it tested a couple years ago, it's a factor. So this is a urine test, and you usually want to do it by trying to push toxins out before you take the test. So I did that, and the one that I was very high in was okra toxin A, and this is a toxin that comes from the aspergillus and penicillin families, which we definitely had in our old home. And I'm very high. I'm over five times the acceptable range. So there are some suggestions in here on how to treat it, um, which is, you know, helpful. I was already doing some of these things, but I'll definitely be doing more. Um, and Anne has advised me on that because, you know, even when you're a practitioner, it's good to get advice on your own stuff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's really hard to be objective about yourself. And yeah. 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 And I found even for myself, just like for our clients, you know, just getting the work done of getting your supplements and getting on a regimen is, is work. So that's a quick look at the mycotoxin test. And I think I'll skip one to talk to, to show the, just the regular old toxin <laughs> test and chemicals. <laughs> Um, so we have, I'll just show some of my high ones here, pretty high in styrenes, ethyl benzenes used in manufacturing of plastic, car exhaust fumes, building materials, uh, packaging can produce muscle weakness, fatigue, nausea. So, you know, it's, it's hard to fully say where this came from for me without some digging, but that guy came up. Perchlorate came up, um, which is in rocket fuel, fireworks, explosives, <laughs> fertilizers, and bleach. I thought it was in um, dry cleaning, too. I was yeah. That up with something. Is that one in dry cleaning? I think so, um, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. So interesting. I saw something recently, though, that if your father worked as a dry cleaner, you have like some at least three times higher um, likelihood of developing schizophrenia or risk of developing schizophrenia. Kind of just a oh, weird interesting. thing. Yeah, the yeah, way that, it that exposure, the epigenetic stuff, and the way wow. that. Wow. Yeah, yeah perchlorate here in the notes, and I've read this before, it can really disrupt the thyroid. So in the midst of all this toxic exposure I had, I think the leader being molds, my thyroid became dis disrupted for sure. So this is probably a good one um, for me to focus on. And it's suggesting using a reverse osmosis water treatment center or just treatment system, which is going to come up later in the conversation. So that's probably a good one for me to focus on. This baby was off the charts. I had a, a couple mm. off the charts, uh, ethylene oxide, bromo propane you know just just way out of range so i won't spend too long um talking about these two but again just looking for like sources of exposure and then working on detoxifying it through your body through supporting the liver and supporting nutrition and that kind of a thing um so that's that guy so this could be a good test to do so if you have unexplained infertility, unexplained fatigue, maybe you already know your detox pathways are compromised from your genetic testing. Any other ideas, Anne? Um, yeah, I mean, and I think some, sometimes people show up and they feel like they've kind of done all the usual testing, like they've had their adrenals looked at it, you know, and I think sometimes <laughs> it's like, okay, all that stuff is great, and you almost always need to support all that stuff, but there could be some kind of more fundamental underlying things that need to be dealt with if you've been kind of down the road of 
you know, the functional basics in a way and haven't really seen results. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, I, I do think in my own case that, you know, I, I shared, you know, I was eating well and trying my best to manage my stress. And I feel like, you know, I wasn't getting better. And there came a point where I'm like, I know something else is wrong with it. It took a while to get there. Um, because I, I think a lot of us just like beat ourselves up. Well, I'm not trying hard enough. Well, I'm not handling stress well enough. Right. This stuff yeah. is real. This stuff is all around us. I'm surprised how many people have mold in them. People who don't even know where it came from. So, mm. yeah. Okay, I want to show you a couple more toxicity tests, and then we'll move on to the oat test. So this is a water test. I had to take a picture of this because they sent it on paper. Um, so this tests for heavy metals in your water as well as fluoride, and it tests the pH. So Anne and I were talking earlier that she has well water, so she tested hers when she moved in. I live in the desert, and I have city water, and I wanted to get a before test before I buy a water treatment system because I want to know what was in my water, and then did it come out, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. the only real A lot of people are kind of taking stabs at their water. Um, oh, well, I have a Brita. Oh, I have a Berkey. Well, so you can see here in my test that my water is high in arsenic or high-ish in arsenic and a Berkey or a Brita will not remove arsenic. So you have, you know, this is why it's good to know what's in your water first. I also have, and, and you're high in arsenic. And I'm high in arsenic. <laughs> yeah. right. So the biggest sources of arsenic are chicken, rice, and water. And it's in our water. It has, but I had arsenic for a long time. So who knows what was in my yeah. old water. I yeah. certainly eat chicken and rice. <laughs> Uh, uranium is high. That doesn't seem good. And aluminum is high, which is pretty toxic to your brain. You know, it's not a good thing. So this is great information for me because now I can move on to getting a, um, a water treatment system and then I'll retest. So I think we'll be offering this test, you know, with no extra interpretation fee because it's pretty easy to see. Um, and you can kind of, you know, deal with it as you will. Okay, last toxin test. Oh, wait, I got two more. Um, let's see, uh, the dust test. Okay, so we showed earlier how to test your body for mycotoxins, and this is when we tested our dust in our house for mycotoxins. So we were positive on two types of toxic dust, but interestingly, they weren't the same two that popped up on my recent urine test. So my recent urine test showed ochratoxin A as being very high, and this particular dust sample didn't pick it up. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, what it did pick up was the trichothecene group, which is from the stachybotrys mold, and uh, that was present here, but it wasn't present in my urine that day. And then this gliotoxin is from the aspergillus mold, so it didn't show up in my urine, or I'm not sure if it was tested in my urine, but um, just interesting that it's a little different. So this is why I think we can't put every, you know, we can't rely on tests exclusively for information. Um, so oh, this was actually my husband's test. <laughs> I'm realizing this is my husband's test. We think, oh no, this is our whole house. This was dust. So this was in our, in our shared space. So just interesting. Um, to, to note and you know sometimes I think things are missed on on a test that are still real if you're having the symptoms and the situation suggests yeah, it for sure yeah okay one last one I'll show you here is also related to mold so this is a, a Marcon's test it's a nasal swab test that you put up your nose and put you know put back in the envelope and send back and it tests for Marcon stands for multiple antibiotic, antibiotic resistant something staph infection. <laughs> uh, so this is my more recent test. I've tested twice for this. I still have Marcon's infection in my nose. It's showing what antibiotics would not work for me. And it's showing actual mold spores in my nose. And it said small amounts. So that was an improvement from my original test but I was still, you know, uh, colonized. So, um, you know, it's hard to get mold out because it's deep in these 
these tissues in the sinuses and even they think it could be in bone, it's in lung tissue. So uh, it's not a piece of cake to get out, which you know makes me feel better that I've been at this a long time. And it's understandable it's not over yet. It's, it's not easy. So go nice on yourself because yeah. it's hard to <laughs> get yeah. this out. All right. So all the ones we showed so far are, are ones you can do at home. Actually, 100% of the ones we're showing today you can do at home. And this last one, Anna, I'll let you cover. This is my organic acids test. If you don't mind to explain what an organic acid is, how the test works mm -hmm. uh, to get us started. Yeah, sure. So this is, again, a urine test. Um, so what organic acids are actually looking at, they're kind of um, like metabolic intermediaries. So what I mean by that is that, you know, there are all these different cycles that our bodies go through um, in the process of like detoxification or of leveraging um, like glucose and fats for energy or, you know, so there are all these different sort of cyclic processes that our body goes through. And there are these steps along the way. And then there are byproducts of those steps that should get used for the next step or that should get excreted or whatever. So um, organic acids are some of these intermediaries in these cycles, some of these byproducts. Um, so typically in pathways of like, like I was saying, central energy production, detoxification, neurotransmitters, or even just like intestinal microbial activity and that kind of thing. So usually we don't want to see these organic acids in high amounts um, because that would indicate that, you know, one step in the process is happening, but then the next step is for whatever reason, not uptaking whatever that byproduct is and funneling it to the next step. So if you're excreting a lot of it in urine, there's like a break in the cycle and it's not completing. Yeah. So that can often lead to like, if it's a Krebs cycle step, you won't generate as much ATP as you should. So you won't have energy, right? Or if it's okay. a detoxification step, you wind up toxic, right? So that's kind of the gist. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good explanation. And I think it reminds me of that hair test. It's like, oh, you, you're dumping magnesium into your hair. What's, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, great. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if you could just next go through, you know, there's a lot of markers on here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I only had what, like really a few things that were standouts. Yeah. So yeah. I thought we could point out my standouts and then everyone will have, you know, different standouts. Yeah, for sure. So there are a couple things that you'll notice right away. So there are two things on this first page that, that Bridget's showing there that are showing as high. Um, and so the first one is an indicator. All of these, um, this first section is yeast and fungal markers. And so the first one is specifically related usually to um, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is often considered to be a beneficial yeast. Um, and oftentimes supplemented. And so I know Bridget has been supplementing that. And so my guess is that that's why that one is showing up as high. Um, it can create imbalances if it's too high. But um, as you'll see with the next one, number seven, Arabinose, that's high, like off the charts high, you see the range is 29 up to 29 and Bridget's at 136. So that one's for Candida. Um, looks at candida specifically. So that's a pretty opportunistic, unfriendly yeast. And so sometimes we'll try to crowd that out with some more beneficial yeasts like Saccharomyces. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend stopping supplementation with Saccharomyces until the um, candida marker is more under control because that one looks... Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. I think this is really you're showing where kind of the expertise comes in because I think mm -hmm. if we're guessing it, candida guessing at gut population it's like well I don't know I've tried this I've tried that but like you're actually able to see here and interpret that maybe for now some bit more beneficial yeast for me to crowd out this candida and as, yeah, as a side note it's nice that I've had a few of these tests um, because we know that I have mold and then mold really breeds candida yeah. Um, I also have that glyphosate causing, you know, contributing <laughs> yeah. to leaky yeah. gut. All the mold leaks, le leaky gut. I just, I just, you know, this is, I didn't kind of discuss this with you, Am. I had just done a parasite cleanse before this. And it could have been too the candida, like, was really flourishing after that mm -hmm. parasite cleanse without me addressing it, like, quick enough. I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and I mean, and sometimes I think too about the biofilm disruption process, like yeast really um, does form biofilms. And so whenever you do a parasite cleanse, part of that involves whatever herbs you're going to use. I mean, sometimes you'll do specific biofilm disruption, but all those products will start to disrupt biofilms. And then all of a sudden stuff kind of, you're exposed more to what's there, even if it was there before, but it it's accessible. And organic acids, honestly, I think this is the best way to test for yeasts. Um, stool tests and stuff will pick it up sometimes, but not with the degree, I think, of accuracy and um, sensitivity that an organic acids test has for it. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I can scroll because I think the rest is pretty normal here. Yeah. Anything interesting on this page? Um, so nothing too out of whack. I mean, so low markers are generally okay. You know, I see the citric acid starting to kind of go a little bit high, but, um, you know, I'm not like not that, terribly yeah. concerning. It's, it is interesting because intestinal yeast can produce, um, citric acid. So it just kind of leads me back to that again. Yeah, and I haven't told you yet because I haven't talked to you since, but I started my Candida protocol. I can barely do it. Oh, I have yeah. so much die off. It's so intense. So mm -hmm. I'm just having to really scale back a lot and keep finding like the highest I can do, which is like very low. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and it brings me back to the detoxification piece too, because the citric acid can also be related to a depletion of glutathione. And so when you have all this like toxic load and difficulty with detoxification, glutathione becomes like another thing. And we know your glutathione looks kind of okay on this test, but we know that you're doing a lot to support that too and need to. So Yeah, so I was using my glutathione spray to get ready for this test mm -hmm. so maybe it was working because it showed up as being okay on the test but um uh i think i could do even more glutathione for sure yeah. so yeah glutathione is an antioxidant naturally produced by the body and it's just really manages a lot of things to detoxify the body just kind of giving a side note but you can also eat foods to benefit it or you can do a coffee ben enema to benefit it or you can just supplement with um, like a very high grade of glutathione so yeah yeah. So, okay. Your neurotransmitters were definitely interesting. And so this is one where anything kind of below or above the mean, meaning within those orange bands are kind of remarkable. So we see here that the HVA, which is kind of an indicator of dopamine turnover, which is a neurotransmitter is lower than ideal, as is the VMA, which is an indicator of norepinephrine, epinephrine turnover. So having those low can be a result of chronic stress, um, which Bridget's been under at least physically, if not on many other fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Poor absorption, right? So leaky gut, that can have a factor because these all have amino acid um, precursors. And um, so then, you know, it can also be due to like low consumption of protein and that kind of thing. But I think Bridget's diet's pretty good. It's mostly about absorption and stress and um, fatigue and, to and toxicity likely. Um, what was interesting for Bridget specifically is that we see the serotonin marker, the 5-HIAA, actually really quite high. Um, and so stress can also cause that to go high as well as causing it to go low. Um, supplementation, I think you were doing some supplementation with 5 hp I do some 5 hp but I don't really remember the time frame that I did it close to this test, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it could have been right by but it, but it could have not been. Right. So that was pretty high. Um, and there can be a lot of things that maybe trigger the body to do that. Um, but I think the fundamental thing is that there's an imbalance. So typically we want to have kind of our ratios of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and, um, but especially dopamine and serotonin kind of in a nice ratio with one another. And so this is pretty disparate. Um, and I think having levels of serotonin that are too high can also lead to like grogginess and fatigue and that kind of thing. Cause serotonin is a precursor to melatonin too. So 
Um, my daytime serotonin may be high. Mm-hmm. Probably yeah. high with the looks of this test. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely could be explaining some symptoms for me too. And I, I'll mention that you put me on the tyrosine amino mm-hmm. acid and the phenylalanine. I also wasn't too sure about how those were going for me. So I had to back off. I'm like my own worst patient. Mm-hmm. I just started everything <laughs> like full force, right? <laughs> um, so I, now I just do the tyrosine. And I seem to like that. But the other guy, the phenylalanine, I haven't tried yet again. I will. I, I felt like when I was taking both of them, I was feeling um, like this internal restlessness, just sort of yeah. discomfort. So I was like, eh, I don't, I'm not crazy about that. But the tyrosine seems to be going okay on its own. And then I'll, I'll try the other guy again. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's about finding a good dose. I mean, you're a small person, right? So sometimes when we look at the dosage amounts that are on bottles or that are be recommended for a normal sized person would might be less appropriate for somebody. Okay. You know, and, and as little you, as you are. Those like, I, I thought the tyrosine is perhaps a little stimulating. So I just do it like it is. Yeah. In the afternoon. Okay. And then the other guys are a good time of day to take that. Yeah, so typically I would recommend doing like tyrosine, um, phenylalanine, those types of things earlier in the day. And with 5-HTP, I'll often actually have people take it, you know, an hour or two before bed because it can be more calming, sedating, um, and it does convert into melatonin. So um, I'll often do it that way, though I know a lot of people who take them both and a lot of practitioners who recommend both kind of throughout the day. But I think a lot of people are in this tired and wired cycle, right, where they are really fatigued and then also have jumpiness and anxiety and all of that. And so there's a little bit of managing of that that I find myself doing with a lot of clients. Okay. Is it possible, Anne, that I have this much serotonin in my urine because it's not getting into like my cells or like not landing? Well, yeah. So, I mean, the turnover, um, it's kind of an interesting thing because when you're seeing high or low with the neurotransmitters, um, they can indicate kind of similar things or different things. So this one specifically is a breakdown product of serotonin. Um, Yeah. So I'm just sort of looking at a note I have here. It says 80 to 90% of peripheral serotonin. So that that's made outside the brain is depleted. Um, when taking like SSRIs, but you're not doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. And you're high. Yeah, I think it's probably mostly stress, honestly. And that's just like driving it and probably physical stress, right? So when I think about calming too, it's like sort of the body trying to soothe itself. So sometimes the body will also um, kind of shift how it's metabolizing T3, right, or converting T3. So you'll wind up with higher levels of reverse T3 than um, normal and lower levels of free T3 when your body has an infection. And it's kind of like the body trying to force you to calm down so that it can heal. Like to, so your energy gets stifled, so you're low, so you can't do as much so the body can put its resources where it wants to. So it, that may be a factor with this too. Okay, okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Should we look at these? There's some markers of like nutrition. Yeah. So, um, a lot of these kind of nutritional markers are used to, um, kind of as cofactors and intermediaries in a lot of these steps. So these can be important things. And oftentimes if you see like mm, impairments in some areas, it could be because you don't have the nutrients needed. Um, you know, as we look at this, they mostly look, some of them, so the ones that have like, I don't know if you want to put your mouse over that sort of asterisk star next to them. Um, so a high value will indicate deficiency for those and not for the other ones. So only the ones that are indicated. Um, but uh, so we look at like, you know, the B6 looks a little bit on the low side. So that number 51 um, and that, again, kind of brings us back to, it could be a result of malabsorption, dysbiosis, candida, um, high oxalates, which yours weren't terribly high, but candida always produces oxalates. So those commonly go together. So some, just some B6 supplementation could be beneficial. Yeah, we Um, did add that. That was easy. You know, I was already doing some of that, but B6 
vitamins are water soluble they don't stick around so yep. very easy to add again especially if you're like me and your client with fatigue and you know b vitamins can help so it's a super easy solution there Yep. The vitamin C looks like slightly low. It often looks low on this test again, because it's really water soluble and this test requires some water restriction. So um, I don't really make much of it when I see it low. However, most people with chronic health issues can stand a little bit of vitamin C just to support immunity and all that. So um, yeah. And another thing that's valuable from a test like this, even if you have a pretty good health basis is like, um, you know, I, I'm definitely can be guilty of it being inconsistent. You know, I have a lot of supplements around my house. <laughs> I have vitamin C. <laughs> I have CoQ10, which came up on here. You know, I have B12 lozenges. But, you know, you wrote out a plan for me, and I kind of just need to write out what I already am taking and add in the new things and just really be consistent because I'm, you know, it's easy to feel busy and oh, I don't have time to keep up with all this, but – if you go back to these toxicity markers, you know, these are no joke. Like yeah. just the mold alone is like a carcinogen. It's very serious. So, you know, better to really get organized and really set aside some time to, to tackle your protocol um, and stick with it. And then you can always, you know, retest. And what would you say is like a good amount of time on this guy? Like a few months or... Yeah, so I always think it sort of depends on what else is going on. I mean, for you, because there's so much data and we know so much, yeah, I mean, I would probably do some things and maybe relook at it in 90 days. Um, okay. For some people, it's like, okay, if we know that there's the candida, but there's other things going, you know, it might be a longer period of time if we have a multi-step protocol we're in the middle of, but yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let me see. I'm going to try to exit out of here. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Hold on a second. So while I work on this, um, yeah, I hope that was a helpful summary. I know that was a, like a lot of information if you're not familiar with these tests, but I know many of you are very nerdy and <laughs> do, do you want to hear all this? It's, you know, you don't have to memorize this. There's no test at the end, but if you're like, huh, remember that thing she said about so-and-so, you know, that might be a test you want to run. If you've been concerned about your chemical exposure, if you, you know, lots of people come to me now out of the woodwork, no pun intended to say, well, I think I might have mold in my house too. So now you can test it. Um, it, it creates some peace of mind to test um, for sure. So you, at least you know your enemy kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, we just definitely, oh, here we go, finally I can stop. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, you know, that's why testing I think is so appealing. Uh, in, in the modern world, we're facing a lot of risk that we don't understand and that we can't, unfortunately, that we can't eat away uh our problems really not with my i don't know <laughs> you can do that to a certain extent right but you're not going to eat away you know with good diet look i have a good diet and i still have glyphosate in my body i still have all this stuff going on yeah. um so it's, it's just proof um you know my father-in-law who i've mentioned a couple of times on the show is living with us and has late stage cancer and you know, he's trying to wrap his head around what to do. And he says, well, I think if I just, you know, I exercise and I eat right. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not <laughs> enough. Like if you're going to fork out the chemotherapy or do an adjunct, like you really, it needs to be like a full-time job for you to like be detoxifying. You know, it doesn't have to just be supplements. It can be meditation. It can be sauna. It can be being in nature. You know, there's a lot of things you can use outside of supplements, but really there's a lot of healing to be done when we become out of balance um, beyond diet and exercise. Yeah. 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 I talk to people a lot who are like, they have, you know, IBS or something like that. And they're like, it's okay. As long as I eat really, really strictly. And I go, 
that's not okay then. <laughs> you know? Well, I was the same with Musk Candida that I just found out I had still so severely. Uh, you know, I don't feel like I show a lot of signs of Candida, but I cannot have alcohol. I cannot have sugar. Like these are like, no way. It's not even like a preference. It's just like my body will like explode if mm -hmm. I have those things. Yeah, I feel it immediately. So I, I, I guess I kind of on some level knew that was candida, but when we can kind of control things, like you said, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a solution. It ends up to be a restrictive lifestyle for yeah. life. Uh, same with SIBO. So many people are on the SIBO diet or yeah, candida diet and they're just stuck with it. Yeah. That's not a solution, but here I, you know, just dropping in a few herbs for me for candida has been extremely powerful, like super powerful. So it's, it was really a, great for me to have your help with that because, um, you know, I'm doing all these things, sauna and all this, but I didn't know that candida, the candida was such a, an issue. And so now I do. And I think when I clear it, I'll feel less inflammation in my body, right? I'll, I'll start yeah. to feel more energy. Um, so, so it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then kind of, I think just like looping it back to the toxin piece, because candida is opportunistic. And so it thrives in an environment that is otherwise compromised. And so I think that some people get in a loop with candida where they're treating it, you know, once or twice a year, every year and wondering why it recurs. And it's usually because there's something else that's creating an environment that supports it. So. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I'll have to highlight uh, as we advertise this show because a lot of people are concerned about candida and they, they kind of have a sense they have it and they never quite get rid of it yeah. Uh, because you can't just get rid of it. You have to get rid of other things going on as well. So great. Well, Anne, thank you so much for your time. Sure. I appreciate you coming on. And yeah, if you have questions for us or you're like, the time has come. The moment is calling you to get some functional testing and get on a protocol of your own. Um, I think you've gotten, hopefully from this, like a good impression that Anne knows her stuff on this and she's taken a lot of people through protocols. So, you know, it's just, it can, the guessing can end and the solutions can, you know, start changing your symptoms. So that's the good news. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks, everyone.